Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, welcome all, and uh, welcome to this uh, final and fourth webinar of Carbon Lab 10th Anniversary Series. And uh, we, in this series, we this is the fourth webinar. We have started this series from mid December. In fact, we have our first uh, webinar on 20th December on the topic carbon materials and energy storage devices with the three speakers, uh, Professor Ashto Sharma, Professor Mark Madhu, and Dr. Tata and Rao. Uh, it was followed by the second webinar on nanofibers on uh, January 16th uh, with uh, another two eminent speakers, Professor Sriram Ramakrishna and Dr. Nisa Salim. And then last uh, month, we had the third webinar on electrochemical sensors in which Dr. Mahesh, Dr. Sanu Gandhi, and Dr. Subaya has participated as a speakers. And now this is the final uh, webinar in the series on functional materials and surfaces. Uh, well, we have uh, another two eminent speakers for this webinar, uh, Professor Ravibhata Mukherjee and Dr. Manish Kulkarni, uh, who are my uh, good friends since my PhD time. And it's really privileged to have uh, both of them in this webinar. So before we uh, proceed with the uh, webinar. Now, I would also like to remind that uh, this 10th year anniversary of Carbon Lab, we have celebrated uh, by having this webinar series, as well as we organized a couple of competitions like uh, internship competition in which we have declared the winners last in the last webinar. So we have we have selected three uh, interns who will be doing the internship at the Carbon uh, Lab in this year 2021. And also we have organized the International Sci Art Image Competition along with INEAS and uh, uh, two other national academies of Bangladesh and uh, Thailand. So with this, uh, we would like to conclude our 10th year anniversary next uh, by next month. And this webinar series is going to end uh, after, the, after today's webinar. So before we start the proceedings for today's webinar, now I request my students, two of the PhD students who will be moderating the session today uh, Ruxana and uh, Sony. So hand over to you, Ruxana and Sony. Please proceed. Very warm and pleasant morning to one and all. I'm Ruxana, along with my colleague Sony, PhD scholar from the Carbon Lab, IIT Hyderabad, would like to welcome all the viewers in the fourth webinar of the series titled Functional Materials and Surfaces Observing 10 Years of Success of a Car Carbon Lab. Let us start the webinar with a presentation by Aarti on the topic, super hydrophobic and anti-reflectic surfaces. I request Aarti to share her slides. I think you were muted hydrophobic and anti-reflective surfaces. The 10th year anniversary celebration of Carbon Lab. On behalf of Carbon Lab, I, Aarti Gupta, research scholar at IIT Hyderabad, would like to summarize the research work done in the area of super hydrophobic and anti-reflective surfaces. I would discuss the key outcomes from the research work done by Dr. Srinath and by myself with the collaboration of Professor Bainpal. Before presenting our research, I would like to spend few minutes to introduce you with the motivation of the work. If you see the current energy scenario, then 81% of the total world energy supply is coming through the fossil fuels, that is coal, oil, and natural gas. If, to produce electricity, fossil fuels are burned in presence of oxygen, which results emission of a carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which affects the environment in many ways as a global warming and climate change. One of the best solutions here is to utilize the renewable energy sources more efficiently and effectively as it's clean, green, and safe. Among all the renewable energy sources, sun is an ultimate source of energy. The sun energy can be utilized by making solar cells as energy harvesters. Uh, solar cells are limited in terms of its efficiency because of three main losses. One is optical loss, recombination loss, and resistance loss. Optical loss, which one of the major loss among all the losses, is because of the reflection of incident light from the surface of a cell, which is around 35% in case of a silicon. This optical loss can be minimized by using the light trapping structures and also by using the anti-reflective coat. 
anti-reflective and hydrophobic surfaces are inspired from the nature. First example is Mothai, which shows excellent anti-reflectivity because of its hierarchical structures. Another is Lotus leaf, which shows excellent self-cleaning property. Moreover, there are various plant leaves and flower petals, which shows excellent anti-reflectivity and super hydrophobicity. Moving to the experimental work, here we have identified a commonly grown garden plant called Canna indica. The beauty of the plant is it shows super hydrophobic as well as anti-reflectivity throughout its all major parts like seed pot, seed pot, flower petal and leaf. In the next image, we can see its seed pot is having high uh, aspect ratio structures. Here we have replicated its seed pot as well as flower petal structures in two different polymer. One is RF fusion, which is hydrophilic in nature, and another is um, PDMS, which is hydrophobic in nature. Figure two shows the symmetric of the fabrication procedure. First, the sample was fixed in the battery disc, followed by pouring of the PDMS, then curing at 80 degrees C for three hours. Then the sample was swelled in chloroform for easy deattachment. Here we received a negative PDMS replica. This negative PDMS replica was again fixed in battery disk and followed by similar step to get the positive RF replica. Figure 3 and 4 summarizes the SEM images of uh, original seed pot as well as the original flower petal and its replicas. Here, as we can see here, we were able to successfully replicate the structures onto the surface of PDMS as well as onto the surface of RF0 gel. Further, we have done the wetting studies of original seed pot petals and their replicated surfaces. The first video display the super hydrophobic behavior of the petal replica, where the droplet is freely rooting on the surface. Similarly, the RF replica also exhibits super hydrophobic behavior on the texture surface. Figure five shows figure five shows digital and microscopic images of original seed pot and its replica which further confirms the super hydrophobicity. Optical measurements were done by measuring the reflectance of incident light from the surface of the films. In case of a plain PDMS, the reflectance was around 10%, which was reduced from 10 to 5% in case of a petal PDMS negative replica. This was a great achievement where a, where a hydrophilic surface was converted into a super hydrophobic surface. Further, we also extended our work in replicating the hierarchical surfaces. Here we have identified four different underside leaves possessing different hierarchical structures which exhibit super hydrophobic property. By replica molding technique, we have replicated these structures onto the surface of polymer. Onto the surface of polymer. Um, as we can see, in case of a plant A, B, and C, we were not able, we were only able to replicate microstructures, not the nanostructures. It may be because of loosely bonding of these nanostructures with the surface. However, in case of a plant D, we were able to replicate micro as well as the nanostructures. Here, we have investigated button property of replicas. First, we have done the self cleaning test for three different surface morphology. One is plain PDMS, another is micro texture PDMS, and third one is hierarchical texture PDMS. As we can see here, in case of a hierarchical texture PDMS surface, water droplet is really rolling off and taking out the dust. Next, anti-reflective study was done by measuring the reflectance of incident light from the surface of the uh, films. In case of a hierarchical texture PDMA surface, the reflectance was lowest, which is shown by this blue color line, and it was found around 5%, where the plain PDMA shows the reflectance around 10%. In this work, we try to fabricate the light trapping structures in lab by using very simple and cost-effective wet etching technique. Etching of silicon 100 in alkaline solution result in formation of pyramids or hillocks bounded by four crystallographic planes. These structures can be used as a light trapping structures in solar cells, optical displays, etc. Here, optimization of etching concentration, etching time, and etching temperature is needed to produce a dense and uniform surface morphology. Because in case of non-dense and less uniform surface morphology, light, light hitting 
at a pyramid may not get any nearby structure to take the second bounce and it may go back to the atmosphere. In the first work, we studied the effect of etching concentration on surface texturing of silicon 100. Here we have used spectromethyl ammonium hydroxide as an agent as its CMOS compatible. Figure 1 shows the SEM images of 0.5 and 1 weight percent DMH is sample. As we can see here, it gives up a 0.5 weight percent DMH sample. Structures are more dense and uniform compared to 1 weight percent DMH is sample. Figure 2 shows the reflective spectra of 0.5 and 1 weight percent DMH sample. Reflectance was also lower in case of a 0.5 weight percent DMH sample, where, where, the, where a uniform and dense surface morphology was observed. The calculated lowest solar weighted reflectance was around 9.7%. In case of a 0.5 weight percent, 80 minute DMH is silicon sample. To confirm the uniformity qualitatively, we have measured the surface area variation for these two samples. For this, we measure the surface area at different locations of the sample and as we can see here, in case of a 0.5 weight percent DMH sample, the surface area variation is much lower compared to 1 weight percent DMH is samples. Here, first time, we achieved reflectance around 9.7% in very low concentration DMH is sample, which makes it very suitable for large area surface texture. In this experiment, we studied the effect of etching temperature by fixing the etching concentration. As we, re as we received the lowest reflectance in 0.5 weight percent DMH, so we fixed the etching concentration at 0.5 and we varied the etching temperatures. Uh, we have done um, the experiment for four different temperatures, 80, 85, 90, and 95 degrees C. Figure 1 shows the surface morphology of all the uh, texture samples, as we can see here, the structures in lower temperature age samples are much uniform compared to the higher temperatures. And if we compare the surface morphology of this uh, 80 and 85 degree C, we found that the structures in 85 degree C are much uniform and dense compared to the 80, 80 degree C. The same trend was also found in the reflectance spectrum where we have seen the lowest value in 85 degree C age samples compared to the other temperature age samples. The uniformity of these samples was confirmed by measuring the surface area variation. So as we can see here, the surface area variation was much lower in 85 degree C age sample compared to the other temperatures. So by increasing the temperature, we have reduced the etching time from 80 minute to 25 minute and the lowest for the similar reflectance value. The surface can be used for large areas of structuring um, in silicon based solar cells. Further, this work was extended by replicating the structures onto the surface of PDMS by soft lithography. For this, we have used texture silicon sample as a mold and we replicated these structures on PDMS surface. Figure 1b is showing the negative PDMS replica, which has inverted pyramidal structures, and figure A1c is showing the positive PDMS replica, which has the pyramidal structures. Figure 2 shows the reflectance and transmitters spectra of the texture silicon samples and texture silicon and polymer samples. As we can see here, in case of a plain PDMS, the reflectance was around 10%, which was reduced to 5% in negative PDMS replica, where the transmitters was increased from 88% to 94% in uh, negative PDMS replica. Water contact angle was also measured and it was increased from 94 degree to 127 degree and 130 degree in negative and positive PDMS replicas respectively. In conclusion, we can say that we were able to replicate self-cleaning and anti-reflective surfaces by using very simple and cost-effective soft lithography, wet etching approach and wet etching approach, which can be applied on solar cells. Anti-reflective nature of these surfaces can help in efficiency increment by minimizing the reflectance loss, where superhydrophobic nature of these surfaces can help in increasing the life of the device by self-cleaning. 
Thank you. This is all about the brief summary of our research. I would like to acknowledge all our funding agencies and collaborators. Thank you everyone for your support and for your kind attention. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, Aarti, for your presentation. It's my immense pleasure to introduce our first eminent speaker, Dr. Rabibhuta Mukherjee, who is well known in the field of surface patterning, self-assembly, and thin film dewetting. Dr. Rabibhuta Mukherjee is presently a professor at Department of Chemical Engineering at IIT Kharagpur. He obtained his PhD from IIT Kanpur in year 2007. He joined IIT Kharagpur in the Department of Chemical Engineering as an assistant professor in 2009 and became a professor in 2018. Prior to joining IIT Kharagpur, he was a scientist at CSIR, Central Glass and Ceramic Research Institute between 1997 and 2009. He's an internationally recognized expert in soft nano patterning and thin film instability, with specific emphasis on ordering and arranging objects by confined self-organization at nanoscale and mesoscale. So far, he has published 80 international journal papers and hold seven Indian patents. He has also been awarded the CSIR Young Scientist Award in 2007, the MRSI Medal in 2014, and the SERB Star Award in 2020. He is presently the chairman of DST funded Sophisticated Analytical and Technical Help Institute, Sati, at IIT Kharagpur. So, without wasting any time, let's welcome Professor Abhiprata Mukherjee to enlighten us with his presentation on topic nanoparticle mediated stabilization and morphology modulation in polymer blend and bilayer thin films. I would request all the viewers to post their questions in YouTube chat box. We'll take them up at the end of this webinar. Thank you, Roxana, for this uh, kind introduction, which is, uh, you'll soon realize it makes no merit because uh, uh, anyway, for the reasons probably I will not share online. I must thank Chandra and more than that, congratulate Professor Chandra Shekhar Sharma for developing one such a wonderful laboratory at IIT Hyderabad which sort of coincides with roughly the 10 year celebration of IIT Hyderabad itself. The Institute, needless to say, is actually scaring us, the older IITs heavily, and it's knocking at the doors of turning out to be one of the top and premier institutes of the country. I have no doubt about that. And I would not hesitate in saying that Carbon Lab at IIT Hyderabad is probably the Kohinoor of IIT Hyderabad. And uh, all the students who have joined us, I should thank your lucky stars and feel extremely privileged that you have a mentor like Chandra, who is not only an outstanding faculty, outstanding researcher, a very young and very dynamic achiever, but also a very, very nice human being. In fact, uh, as you said that I had to graduate in 2007, it's more like a push from behind because otherwise Chandra would have graduated before me. So I had to somehow sum up my thesis, submit and say goodbye. Manish is a witness, so I can say all this. So with this, let me try to share my screen. And um, if you get disappointed with the talk, I'm sorry about it, not much I can do. Fault lies entirely with Chandra, but here we go. So what I'm going to talk in the next uh, 25 minutes or so is on thin film instability, something I have been doing for ages and I do nothing else, unlike Chandra who has deviated into so many verticals. So we will look into the effect of nanoparticle in thin films. And I'm very glad to listen to the previous lecture by Aarti because more than anybody else, Chandra will appreciate that it has strong overlap with uh, the type of work I do, hydrophobic and self-cleaning surfaces. But more, but more importantly, since you were talking about photovoltaic devices, uh, one such photovoltaic device, which is probably pitted as the future of photovoltaics beyond solar, beyond silicon technology, is the bulk heterojunction solar cells. And in fact, the type of work I'm going to talk about is of immense importance in bulk heterojunction solar cells because the uh, since uh, the bulk heterojunction solar cells or the organic uh, photovoltaics are indirect band gap materials, excitons come into play there and exciton lifetime is an important issue. Therefore, you'd like to have interfaces as closely available as possible, and that would require even distribution of the two phases. And nanoparticle containing polymer thin films are actually a good model system for understanding the phenomena or essentially the degradation of such solar cells. So the outline of my talk is I will talk to the audience a little bit about this so-called thin film instability, what exactly is so special. There might be non-experts who will get an idea. And then straight away, I will go on to what I have to present, the effect of nanoparticle addition 
to riveting films and to polymer blends if time permits. So if I ask a general question, what is so special about the nanoscale? Well, probably the most common answer that I will get is the quantum confinement effect. Or in other words, if you make things very, very small, if you go down to nano length scale, essentially the band structure starts to change and therefore intensive properties starts to become extensive. And therefore probably it is known to many of you that semi-crystalline quantum dots, if you can tailor their size, they sort of start emitting in different colors. Uh, for example, if you take some solution of gold nanoparticles, they don't look beautiful like gold. They look dirty brown like this because the surface plasmon resonance or the nature of the surface plasmon resonance changes, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very, very well appreciated aspect of the so-called nanotechnology. But there is another aspect of nanotechnology which is not that well appreciated or the nanoscience or the nanoscale. And that is this length scale is entirely dominated by Van der Waals interaction or the intermolecular interactions. So it turns out that probably many of you are aware about the Van der Waals interaction, what it is, the most common being the induced dipole, induced dipole type interaction. And the strength of this interaction scales as one by X to the power six. And please remember that uh, essentially the gravitational force or the potential energy sort of scales as MGH. So it's H to the power one, and here it is H to the power minus six. So now it's very simple mathematics that if you keep on reducing H, at very low length scale, MGH tends to zero while one by H to the power six picks up. Therefore, roughly this, uh, the strength of this induced dipole, induced dipole interaction stretches by roughly around 10 nanometer, which is the non-retarded Van der Waals interaction, right? Uh, so it has, th th there is no effect of gravity and staying even in our earth, this is a length scale where you can almost feel everything at a microgravity situation. Uh, one can do a bit of simple mathematics and can show that the strength of this interaction, instead of the two particles, let's say molecules stretches by around 10 nanometers and scales as one by X to the power six, but between two surfaces, it becomes a little longer range and the scaling nature of the scaling changes to one by D squared. So uh, it sort of stretches, the interaction stretches by around 100 nanometer or so between two surfaces. So based on this understanding, we actually define a thin film as something, so film everybody knows, everybody talks about coatings. We see coatings everywhere, starting from paints to those of us who are wearing spectacles. Most of the spectacles come with some coating of the other. Most of the devices we use, touchpad, they all come with some coating or the other. Now, have we asked a question, how thick are these coatings? Now these coatings in most cases, the, the present technology is also to go for optically transparent coatings, which performs the functionality. For example, when you buy a spectacle to a child, you will probably go for an anti-scratch coating. Many of us were, in fact, Chandra used to wear this um, uh, electro, this uh, chromatic coating, so which used to turn black when he used to go out. So how thick are these coatings? So th there is a physics behind it. Certainly the coating is not what you want to have. The coating once is there to provide some functionality. So you don't want to make this coating very, very thin. But then comes the question, how thin can you go? And it turns out that there is a restriction on that. Why? Because of the so-called definition of the thin film that I'm going to present. What it means is that in our context, a film is thin if there is an active Van der Waals interaction between the two interfaces. So what sort of thickness are we talking about? We just talk that between two surfaces, the Van der Waals interaction stretches by about 100 nanometer. So essentially, if the film is thinner than 100 nanometer, there is an active non-zero interaction between these two interfaces. This is what is called the disjoining pressure. Now, it turns out that based on the material of the film, based on the spreading coefficient, right, this interaction can be negative or attractive or repulsive. And please do understand that if you are talking about a liquid film, the surface of a liquid film always has fluctuations because of the internal kinetic energy of the molecules. Typically, so even if you look at the surface of a bucket of water, there are these fluctuations, but these fluctuations, nothing happens. The moment there is some fluctuations, surface tension or the so-called Laplace pressure flattens it out and that's over. But when you are now talking about an ultra thin film where you have these fluctuations on the surface, right? Uh, so you need to understand that there is a local variation in the film thickness. And as a consequence of that, what may happen, the strength of the disjoining pressure changes from point to point. And if the nature of the interaction between the film and the surface or the top surface of the film and the substrate is attractive, 
then the surface tension or the Laplace pressure, which was trying to stabilize the film, now actually has a competition. And based on the relative magnitude of the disjoining pressure and the Laplace pressure, these undulations may not stabilize any further and the film can spontaneously lead to rupture, right? So this is the situation. What you will see is actually a polystyrene film heated above its glass transition temperature to take it to a liquid state. And all you do is do nothing. And you see that the film has disintegrated into these holes and these holes evolve and it forms some droplets. So I was asking how thin a coating you should go for. These are the restrictions. That is the reason you cannot go for very, very thin coatings, right? So you end up taking coatings which are slightly thicker. And then for example, a simple application like a spectacle, if you see, and if you want to have two, three layers of coating for different functionalities, you are actually adding to avoid or circumvent the scare of the spontaneous instability, a thickness of a coating which might be few microns. And then you might be ending up having 20 micron of material in front of your glasses. And just now we were talking about reflection and absorption. So please do understand that maybe 10% or 8% of the light that is coming gets absorbed into these, these layers. So there is always a demand, industrial demand, for developing ultra thin stable coatings, which are also very important from the standpoint of microelectronic industry. Your lab is associated with MEMS activities, and therefore it is known to all of you that miniaturization is actually the key, right? So this is a physics that has been rather well investigated, but still it's a rather new uh, area, research area, because the whole activity started around 1990. So it's just about 30 years of duetting science we are celebrating. Compared to if students are here, let's say in core chemical engineering, you study still very fancy topics like uh, uh, boundary layer, for example, Prandon boundary layer. Do not forget which was which is in place there from 1908. So it's already a 110 year old concept. Right now, Arthi was talking about hydrophobic surfaces. So that is associated with Cassie and Wenzel's state of wetting. Please do understand that these papers were published in 1945. So that's already there for about 75 years. So compared to that, this is a relatively new area of research which is going on. So many of us, including our mentors, have made their careers out of the physics associated with this type of debating and how it evolves. In fact, Professor Ashutosh Sharma is internationally famous and his, it's not an overstatement that this particular paper along with Rajesh, who is now a faculty at Delhi, uh, actually is considered as a benchmark paper where they simulated by based on nonlinear simulations, this morphological evolution sequence of a debating film and the results could be directly compared with the experimental results. So this was in 1998, it still stands out as an outstanding benchmark paper. There have been a lot of additional activities and there has been very high profile papers in nature materials as late as 2002 and 2005. The reasons for debating to a large extent are still unknown because it shows as we discussed that the debating should take place only when the interaction is attractive. That means that you have, you have a film on a non-wettable surface, but there are a large number of examples where you see debating even on a wettable surface. So people have started to argue, probably it's the residual stresses, non-equilibrium configuration of the polymer chains uh, during the spin coating process and everything uh, might be reason for debating. And, and trust me, it is fully yet, full, not yet resolved fully. Uh, uh, so, it's obvious that from the standpoint of coating, it is bad, but it is also interesting to note that you almost do nothing and you create large number of nanostructures. And I do not need to tell to this audience that nanostructures find wide application in several areas. So only problem is a spontaneous instability mediate structure is always random and isotropic. So there has been a lot of work, even we have contributed in this area for a while of uh, do, making these films deviated on topographically patterned substrates and then you can align these structures either in the form of aligned droplets or undulating threads and whatnot. So all type of very fancy looking structures we could create. These structures have no utility, of course, let me add as a uh, sort of a deterrent, but nonetheless, the physics is very, very rich. Uh, we could create a beautiful alternate droplet array with two polymers, which is very fancy, very difficult to create, very delicate control and understanding of the science that is going on. This actually, this particular work by Nandini led to the almost not a discovery, but almost identification of a new phenomena called spin dewetting, where you see dewetting during spin coating itself. And then we realize that many times when a beginner tries to do spin coating and says that a good film has not come and you attribute your cleaning was not good and this and that, 
you throw it away. It's not exactly that. There is a very, very interesting physics where the evaporation dynamics of the solvent and the Marangoni flow, everything coupled together with the non wettability of the surface on a rotating platform, which might lead to the rupture of the casting solution during spin coating itself. So all these things we have done and we could create some beautiful structures with orders, more uh, organized structures with bilayers, everything is there. So anybody interested can look into our older papers. But bottom line is, this is bad. This is bad means de-wetting is undesirable from the standpoint of coating industry. So there has been a lot of activity in suppressing this type of de-wetting. One of the things is to functionalize the surface, modify the polymers, cross-link them, et cetera, et cetera, which are all difficult to scale. So one uh, beautiful technique that Manisha's former boss, Alamgir Karim and his group came up with way back in 2000, again, another absolutely stunning and almost a topic defining paper, I would say, is to add nanoparticles. They added, the first work was done with fullerene. They trace amount to a dewetting film and they could show that a film which would otherwise dewet above a critical concentration of the nanoparticles and which is very, very less like 1% or something weight by weight, the film becomes completely stable. I would like the audience to take note of a particular word above a critical concentration. Above a critical concentration of the nanoparticles, the film becomes stable. So there has been several aspects. So once something comes up, a lot of people start exploring in derivative problems and start identifying the mechanism that is going on. And please do understand that a stabilization problem does not remain a microscopic problem anymore because under a microscope, you take a film and you see nothing happens. So what conclusion do you do? Of course, you say that I have stabilized the film, which is great, which might be very, very useful from the standpoint of coating, but then you need to dig out the science, why it is stabilizing, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to start relying on spectroscopic technique and other techniques as well. So even we did some work with this. In fact, this was my uh, last work at IIT Kanpur before I left with Satinder, another good friend of all of us, uh, where we could show that we could take some particles which do not preferentially phase segregate and there is some sort of a virtual cross-linking around these particles within the polymer matrix and there is a rheology mediated stabilization also. This is not the most common mechanism. There can be other mechanisms. And Manish will remember that was the time when we had our micro Raman installed so this was a very fancy measurement that Chandra, uh, Satinder did for me, where we could, based on this micro Raman signal embedded on the atomic force microscope, can pick up or localize or identify the localization of the particles around the growing holes. So this is not I'm going to talk about. This is already a 10-year-old work. Uh, so the main reason which is considered for the stabilization of these films is that it is argued, it's largely an argument, largely a speculation, that these particles actually migrate to the free surface. And why does the particles migrate to the free surface during annealing? Because of the fact it, it might be enthalpic or the thermodynamics might be based on the surface energy of the particle, the polymer, the surface, but more, more importantly, the entropic contributions come into play. Why? Because a polymer chain that is attached to the uh, free surface or at the substrate surface of the film. So you, this is the substrate and here you have the film. So a polymer chain that is attached to the substrate actually has reduced conformational entropy because the polymer chain cannot sort of oscillate in all directions because you have a rigid substrate in one side. So if a particle now migrates to the substrate, fills up a spot and releases one polymer chain which migrates back to the bulk, then the polymer chain gains conformational entropy. So there is always a competition and balance between the enthalpic effect and the entropic effect. And the physics is absolutely fascinating. Beautiful physics is there. So uh, we also looked into this again in collaboration with Karim, uh, Karim's group. Uh, one of my students, Sudeshna, spent about three months there uh, in Akron. Uh, Karim was there at Akron. And uh, so we looked into these debating phenomena on surfaces with particle containing films, on surfaces with different surface energy. And we showed that there is actually a non-trivial contribution of the surface energy also, which at times can actually overwrite the entropic effects. So all these uh, we studied, but still at that point of time, we were heavily limited to atomic force microscopy and microscopy based techniques only because that is a background that sort of I have inherited. But more and more we were starting to realize that if we need to identify what, what exactly is the role of these particles, we need to probably probe a little deeper. So anyway, so uh, again, here the take home message is the films showed complete stabilization 
after or above a critical nanoparticle concentration, right? So if this much is clear, maybe I will do a quick sum up before I start showing the newer results. So we actually understand that you have a thin film, you can have a thin film, which on a non-wettable surface is prone to spontaneous de-wetting but you can add some nanoparticles or filler particles or various sorts. You can take gold nanoparticles, you can take fullerene nanoparticles, you can take graphene sheets, geo sheets, you can take other type of uh, customized quantum dot particles. If you add them, so generic phenomena is same, this instability can be suppressed above a critical concentration of the nanoparticles. Also, for a polymer film, how do you trigger the DVD? The polymer film typically used as a model system for such studies, it's a hydrodynamic instability. So all the evolution takes place in the liquid phase. But you do not work with a regular liquid like water or hexane because of the fact that these type of liquid will evaporate, right? And therefore you will not know what is the phenomena due to disjoining pressure and what is happening because of evaporation. And also you cannot do solid state characterization later like scanning electron microscopy or atomic force microscopy. So a beautiful technique is to take a polymer film Heat it above its glass transition temperature to take it to the liquid form where it undergoes all the morphological evolution and then simply cool it down, quench it. So not only you can wait till the end and see what is the final consequence, go all the way up to droplet, but just the way as we play a movie here and can pause at any time and say this is an intermediate, you can do that also in real life, right? So here are some more details I will skip. So he, here is something I'd like to highlight. However, for such films, in the de-wetting can also be triggered by exposing these films to solvent vapor. That's another very, very standard rule. So what happens when you expose it to, to or keep such a film in a solvent vapor chamber, the solvent molecule starts penetrating into the film, right? So because this is a good solvent for your uh, polymer. So the film swells and it is believed that the viscosity reduces because of the solvent penetration. Probably there is a little bit of swelling. And as a consequence, the glass transition temperature drops below the room temperature and the film eventually evolves. The, lit, the community, unfortunately or fortunately or whatever, have used this solvent vapor induced de-wetting and this thermal de-wetting almost as an interchangeable technique. So you want to do a de-wetting experiment, you just either do thermal annealing or you do solvent vapor. You rarely care about what you are doing. And you do some calculation of the length scale and you plot and you show that it's resembling the spin order elevating or whatever, and everybody had been very happy about it. So one question as we were trying to look into this problem, we asked is, is it really, are the techniques same? Or there is some difference? So whatever the community knew was, yeah, the insolvent vapor annealing mediated debating, there is a bit of swelling. So the actual film that is debating is probably a little thicker. And that's why you get a little larger droplets or larger features. And you see very fast de-wetting as compared to thermal de-wetting. Then the general belief was that, yeah, probably because the solvent molecules are penetrating, there is a significant drop in the viscosity, and that is probably playing this effect. The other major keyword was, in all this nanoparticle-induced stabilization I mentioned, they, the films all got stable after a critical nanoparticle concentration. And people have concentrated only on that. So nobody till date had looked carefully into what happens in terms of the morphology and the length scale, as well as the dynamics of this nanoparticle, very less amount of nanoparticle containing films, which still debate. So these are the two problems we collectively looked into. And uh, the first set of results we have is that we have films of the same thickness. You can see 12, 20, 38, and 55. Remember, we are all experimentalists out here. And in experiment, you don't have any do-loop. So you have to painstakingly make these films, do them, and, and you have to do some bit of design of experiment, what type of thickness to take, et cetera, et cetera. It's not like a simulation where you would like to see the result from one nanometer to 1,000 nanometer, just run a program which will run for 50 days or 15 days or five days or 15 hours or whatever. So the first observation that we had was if in thermal annealing, a 55 nanometer thick film was not even debating. And uh, the other films were debating, but the timeline, look at the timeline. So a 12 nanometer thick film was taking four hours. 20 nanometer thick film was taking four and a half hours. Uh, uh, this one, 38 nanometer thick film was taking close to uh, 20 days, uh, uh, yeah, some 15 days or something like that. So it was very slow dynamics. And it is understandable, after all, these are heated polymer melt. 
So polymer melt, long chain, entanglement is there, low viscosity, so the dynamics is very, very slow. Understand that. In contrast, you do solvent vapor exposure. So it's half minute, five minutes, six minutes, 16 minutes, and you can divide a film all the way up to 55 nanometer. That's what we checked. We could have gone up to 80 nanometer, 90 nanometer. There is no end to it. We limited our investigation up to this range. And the same old belief. Oh, well, solvent molecules are penetrating the viscosity. And see, as chemical engineers, we are all trained in such a way, or Manish is a physicist, we are all trained in such a way that whenever you see for a fluidic system, the dynamics is very, very fast. You are tend to believe the viscosity is very, very less. Right? This is the standard belief we have. And polymer is a non-Newtonian fluid, et cetera, et cetera. We know all of that. So this is what the community knew. We plotted some of, some of these usual uh, variation of the periodicity, droplet diameter, time of debating. And this is very interesting. You can see that the times, there is an orders difference. So solvent vapor induced debating time was of the order of minute to 10 minute. Instead in thermal annealing, it was like order of days. So anyway, we, we, we sort of thought that we have discovered nothing new. We just quantified it. And then we looked into some little bit more critical measurements. So one thing we measured, again, in the literature, we did not find any measurement. Typically, this, was, this type of measurement should be done or can be done in a neutron, but we did not have an access to a neutron. Neither we had done it in a polymer. So we did a very clever ellipsometric measurement. And for the first time, we could come up with some numbers. So you see, when you do a solvent vapor exposure, it's almost a 75% swelling across the board in all cases, or 50% swelling across the board in all cases that you see based on the thickness. So from that, you can also calculate the solvent uptake. Then we decided that let us calculate some numbers critically. Instead of always being qualitative, quantitative, let's try to quantify what we are observing. So first thing we did was we calculated uh, the, uh, the glass transition temperature from what is known as the Flory Fox equation. And that showed that upon solvent vapor, the glass transition temperature of polystyrene drops to minus 80 degrees centigrade instead of 110 degrees centigrade. So, yes, the conjecture people have that at room temperature, you have a liquid like film is indeed valid. Then we calculated from the Martin's equation the melt viscosity uh, of the solvent vapor uh, exposed to polymer, polystyrene. And this is the equation. So while working on this, particularly the rebuttal of this paper, we actually learned a lot of stuff. We learned about the Huggins constant and Martin equation, et cetera, et cetera. And here came the real surprise for us. From the literature, you can see that at 105 degrees centigrade or just above the glass transition, so sorry, this is not 105, this is 150, I guess, yeah. Right, so TG is 105, so this is around 150. The temperature at which we did the thermal annealing of the films, the melt viscosity is 2.2 into 10 to the power 7 pascal second, which is great. And upon calculation, we found that the solvent vapor annealed samples, the melt viscosity is 9.8 into 10 to the power 6 pascal second. It's completely contrary to the general belief we had that solvent vapor exposed films have a drastic drop in viscosity. In fact, it is very close. And only at 170 degrees centigrade instead of 150 degrees centigrade, if you keep the film at 170 degrees centigrade thermal annealing, the viscosity is match identical. We did that as control experiments also, and we saw that for the thermally annealed sample, the timeline was very, very long, even at 170 degrees centigrade. So the first thing that we came, we realized is reduction of viscosity is not responsible for this ultra-fast dynamics. So then we started to look into more um, certain additional issues. One of them is in solvent vapor exposure, what happens? It actually what happens is ultimately the solvent molecules are penetrating through the film. So it's a process of diffusion. So from the fixed second law, Anuja did some calculations and we came up that the time, uh, roughly order of time for the solvent molecules, so the concentration of the solvent molecules to maximize at the interface is the film thickness square divided by 2 p. And we took from the literature or calculated uh, the value of D. And based on that, we saw that the type of films we are looking at based on their thickness variation, the TM varies between 0.3 to 6.3 seconds. And you are talking about even in solvent vapor dewetting, timeline of dewetting to be of the order of minutes. So as soon as you start your experiment, almost in no time, the solvent vapor reaches the substrate, right? So this is what was happening. So once we realized that the solvent vapor was reaching the substrate, then there was a question. So what happens once the solvent molecules reaches the substrate? Does it spread over the substrate on its own or doesn't? Or what, what remains? Or what happens? 
So then we figured out there is a concept of replacement spreading coefficient, which actually looks into the spreading coefficient of the present polymer versus if the polymer is replaced with the solvent. And we figured out that this, if, if uh, we have a uh, replacement spreading coefficient as a value greater than as a positive value, then the, it, is, it indicates that the solvent will actually spread on the substrate. And in fact, it turns out if you calculate the s rep is positive. So now the picture became very clear. So what was happening is in solvent vapor annealing, the solvent molecule was actually flooding the substrate. And the deviating of the rupture, what you were seeing on the substrate is of the solvent. And therefore it was so fast. And the uh, polymer molecule was just sort of floating on top of these in a dissolved condition on a top of this solvent layer. And it was just following the contours of the solvent molecule, right? So with that, we could explain the fast dynamics as well as the rapid dynamics. Then we did some more experiments uh, with this nanoparticle containing deweighting, right? So we did some thermal annealing. Of course, the timelines were completely different. For example, this image for 5% nanoparticle, 1,000 minutes, and 5% nanoparticle solvent vapor is 1.2 minutes. But now we understand, so we are no longer afraid of that. Uh, so here are some variations posted on the completely different timelines. And we also see how the variation of the periodicity and any. There is some nonlinear dependence which is still to be resolved fully. Uh, here is some dynamics of old growth and thermodynamics. The solvent vapor dynamics is so fast to be actually. And uh, we can also see that in thermal annealing, uh, these are the effect of the film thickness. So 55 nanometer, if you do a thermal annealing, it almost does not deviate. Do and 55 nanometer, if you do a solvent vapor annealing, so it deviates pretty, pretty well. So again, the statement that nanoparticle induced addition of nanoparticle stabilizes the film needs to be relooked. It's a question of what uh, triggering mechanism or deviating engendering mechanism you are adopting that also needs to be employed. So something maybe, uh, if you say that, uh, well, all films about 40 nanometer are stable if the nanoparticle concentration is just 0.05%, it also needs to come with a tag that if you do a thermal annealing, the same film is going to be unstable if you do a solvent vapor annealing. So these are very important findings that came out from this paper. And uh, however, the most important uh, slide is probably this one, again, where we did some very, very careful atomic force microscopy, actually to see what happens to the nanoparticles? Because here, please do remember, we could not do an extra scattering because the film was deviating and you don't have a continuous film. So because of the correlated roughness you have, you will not get some um, fringes, right? So, uh, so what we did was we did some very careful atomic force microscopy and we saw that the particles actually, you can see in the atomic force microscope image that the particles agglomerate on the top of the surface of a deviated drop when you do a thermal annealing as crowns. In contrast, since the solvent has gone all the way down to the substrate, a deviated drop through solvent vapor annealing is completely pristine on the top. And below, when you remove the particles very carefully, we have a protocol for doing that. You see that the substrate has signatures of these particles. In contrast, if you have a continuous film, what you see that there is a signature of some particles at the top interface, as well as at the bottom interface, and collectively, they stabilize the film. So this was one major learning we had. I am running out of time. So, uh, so here are the conclusions of the AFM images. Most important thing is particle containing film deviating. And if you do the thermal annealing, the particles go on to top of the surface. Solvent vapor annealing, the particles go to the bottom of the substrate. This is one of the very, very fascinating and delicate observations. So this is a mint fresh result. I mean, it's a yet to get a page number. So it's just published out there. And I thought I'd share it today. And Chandra, that is the reason I had to prepare a new lecture. Therefore, nothing was prepared till last evening. So I'm running out of time, but I, uh, I will just take two more minutes to showcase one more interesting result. And this is related to polymer blend, something Manish knows very, very well. So if you mix two polymers and just cast them from a common solvent, you directly get some phase separated morphology. It's because of the fact that two polymers, let's say if they're symmetric 50-50, both of them do not occupy 50% of the space. There will be difference in the solubility, there will be difference in their affinity, there will be difference in their molecular weight. And because of variety of reasons, one phase will occupy more than its designated amount, right? So let's say one 50% phase will occupy 60% of the surface. Therefore, the remaining 50% will be cramped into 40%. And you straight away see some self-organized uh, morphology right after spin coating. You never get a flat film, actually. So there has been a lot of research on this area, on the mechanism, how it happens. And the most well-established mechanism, based on some 
in situ dynamic light scattering measurement, which was published in Nature Materials, says that there is actually an in situ bilayer formation and which undergoes again a hydrodynamic instability during spin coding and leads to this type of natural phase segregation. So in this particular work, so of course there's a lot of data out here, which I will not get the time to explain, where we looked into the morphology of a polymer blend changes as a film thickness. So here you vary the film thickness as well as its composition. So here you see a blend which is 75% polystyrene, 15%, 25% PMMA. It's a 50-50 and it is 25-75. So if you now vary the film thickness, in certain cases, the morphology changes, becomes larger or whatever. But in certain cases, for example, in the symmetric blend, you can see some sort of a phase reversal. So for example, up to 26 nanometer, you had a PMMA continuous domain. And at 46 nanometer, you see you have a PS continuous domain. And don't forget that you are actually using a silicon wafer, which always gets covered with the PMMA because of the polar bonding that is present in the carbonyl group that's present in PMMA. So now what we decided to look into how the morphology gets altered if you add nanoparticles. So you see some change in morphology, very symmetric data, systematic data. I will not go into the detail, but some results are very, very exciting. So you add some nanoparticles and you see the phase separation is almost suppressed. So if the phase separation is suppressed and you have two phases, so what exactly is happening? Either you are um, sort of creating a bilayer, in situ bilayer, or you are somehow arresting the spreading. So 50% phase occupies 50% only. So uh, I'll skip all the detail. So we looked in, in detail into this particular sample. We did some XPS and figured out that there is signature of gold going to the surface, free surface. So probably during the spin coating itself, along with evaporation and due to the thermodynamic effects, some gold particles go to the free surface. But more interestingly, along with Professor Milan Sanyal's group at SINP and this flagship program of DST that's running on, we used the Indian beamline at uh, Sukuba and could figure out or find out the electron density profile along the depth of the samples. This is something absolutely revealing for a person who doesn't have a physics background like me and doesn't know spectroscopic technique or that did not know the power of spectroscopic technique. So based on that, what we figured out that this sample actually undergoes a vertical phase separation. So what now happens, what was reported in the Nature Materials paper, that there is an in situ phase separation because of the instability at the interface, because of the nanoparticle, that instability gets suppressed. And now what you are doing is, by in a polymer blend, by adding some nanoparticles, you are almost getting, in a one-shot process, a bilayer, which otherwise you would have required to coat following two sequential spin coding techniques. So that sort of makes it, and if it can be scalable to deep coding or something like that, it can be a fa absolutely fascinating technique for creating multi-layer coatings in one go. And we have all the details. So this is also reasonably recent work. If somebody is interested, you can look into it. So I reached the conclusion. So we presented some glimpse of our activities on nanoparticle containing films and polymer blends. And we now have a very precise understanding on the different mechanisms of solvent vapor induced dewetting versus thermal dewetting, where the particles go, how it affects the morphology of a blend. In fact, these works are actually give rise to more question than the answer. And these are model systems. I work on very simple problems, gold nanoparticle, PSP, MMA, no, no use, no translational value. But let me remind that this, particularly this polymer blend work with nanoparticles is actually very, very closely related to the whole physics of bulk heterojunction solar cells. And that understanding is not there. We still struggle primarily because of the fact that they are unable to control the phase separation and the dynamics uh, subsequently during deployment. So uh, the presence of the particle significantly alters the morphology. So I must thank my students at uh, Kharagpur. And today I particularly presented the work done by Anuja, who took long time, but did some outstanding work and is about to finish her PhD. And Sudeshna and particularly Nandini did the initial work on pattern-directed debating. The collaboration is with Professor Milan Sanyal's group at SSI. Center. Uh, Dr. Orko De, it's Mr. He is a PhD now. He will be sees this. And my former colleague uh, from CGCRI, Dr. Gautam De, who helped us in the XPS measurements. I must also thank my mentor, Professor Ashutosh Sharma, our all our mentors actually, speaker and the host, and funding from uh, the travel to Indian Beamline by Department of Science and Technology and the internal in-house challenge ground project that I have, which is funded from IIT And uh, the reason I have was invited was this, Chandra. You know, Sai Baba hairstyle at that point of time. 2008, Chandra was learning how to make CD patterns and it did help you. You and Manish got a 
uh, ACSAMI, if I remember correctly, uh, based on the learnings that I imparted, and you never acknowledged me in that paper. So these are some old photographs I dug out. We had some real wonderful time. Chandra was much younger to be, but my immediate junior. And that's the beauty of Ashutosh Sharma's lab, I would say, that despite all of us being scattered all over the country and sir, now the topmost scientist of the country in terms of the, he's essentially the custodian of Indian science, the bonding remains. And it's great to see that each one of us are sort of, I am the least one out of the whole lot, are doing excellent work and Chandra being one of the flagship ones along with Dipankar and a few others. Manish is uh, shaping up the Nano Science Center at IIT Kanpur very, very nicely. A beautiful national facility out here. And so with that, uh, and remembering some of the beautiful memories we had, Chandra, it's time for me to say thank you. And I will stop here. This is another picture where you see the host as well as both the speaker for today. It's a 14 year old picture. Time flies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Devyutta Mukherjee, for such an interesting and insightful talk. Again, I would request. How did it yeah, it's about de-wetting, sir. We get more, somewhat idea about de-wetting and all. Yeah. Again, I would request all the viewers to post their questions in the YouTube chat box. We will take them up at the end of this webinar. Moving to the next speaker for today's webinar, we now look forward to Dr. Manisham Kulkarni's talk. Dr. Manisham Kulkarni is a senior scientific officer at Center for Nanosciences, IIT Kanpur. He completed his PhD in physics at Shivaji University, Kolhapur. He then completed his postdoc research first at IIT Kanpur and then at the University of Akron, USA. He also worked as a guest researcher at National Institute of Standards and Technology, Gaithersburg, MD, USA. His area of specialization and expertise is in self-assembly and organization in thin polymer films for micro and nano patterning, nano bio platforms for early detection of pathogens and drug testing, SCRS active materials, combinatorial synthesis and gradient field processing of thin polymer films, phase transitions and orientation control in block copolymers films for high fidelity nanoscale patterns and their studies by neutron and high energy X-ray beams, Sol gel aerosol processing, organic gel and photoresist based films, organic photovoltaic blended films. He has published more than 80 research articles in peer reviewed international journals. He also has two Indian patents and two book chapters. So let's welcome Dr. Manisham Kulkarni to enlighten her, us with his presentation on the topic physiochemical functional nanomaterials and their application. Manish, please unmute. Manish, you have to unmute. Yes. Thank you, Sony, for this nice introduction. Uh, first of all, congratulations to the Carbon Lab. Uh, you have done some excellent work, uh, especially Professor Chandrasekhar Sharma. I'm very happy to call you Professor Chandrasekhar Sharma. <laughs> and you have done some excellent work in last 10 years. It's a great achievement that what you have done, as Rabbi rightly said. In fact, all, all the colleagues that we had at IIT Kanpur, I'm very happy to see what they have achieved in just 10 years. It's great. So let's start. I'll start my presentation. Uh, I'll be talking on physical chemical functional nanometers and their applications. As soon as I came to know that uh, Professor Ravi Prata is going to talk on debating, I removed all debating slides <laughs> because I know he is an expert, world well known expert uh, now on debating. So uh, I tried to skip debating slides from my presentation and I have kept the other work that I have done in the last uh, couple of years or maybe more than that uh, in this work. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, so we'll first talk about some uh, properties of surface and uh, specific surface area, uh, what kind of uh, physical functionalization, chemical functionalization is, uh, some case studies that we have done uh, at uh, Center for Nanosciences and other places that I have been working on in the last 10-15 uh, years. 
and then we will summarize. It will be a short talk. I will not bore you to death too much for too much time. And I have tried to keep no equations in this in this presentation so that you will not be bored much. So let's start with this quote. This quote, very famous quote from Wolfgang Pauli, uh, who says, God made the bulk and the surfaces were invented by the devil. Precisely because the at these uh, due to imbalance of forces at this interface, uh, the properties at the surface change drastically for liquids and solids. So for example, in water, if you consider a molecule setting it the uh, bulk, it experiences probably equal amount of repulsion or attractive forces from all sides. Whereas a molecule setting on the top surface uh, in contact with air or other atmosphere, the, the forces are imbalanced. So it will be having more attractive forces or repulsive forces from the uh, inside of the bulb than the interface. So that leads to very uh, uh, beautiful phenomenon of surface tension. So as you can see, one uh, straddler is uh, straddling on a uh, water just because of the surface tension of the water. So it is unable to break the of the film of this water and it remains stable even on water surface. It can walk on water. So there is another interesting phenomena, uh, especially for nanomaterials, it's very important to understand is this specific surface area. And that is not very intuitive uh, when you look at small uh, size or uh, nanoscale materials. That uh, if you go on uh, reducing the size, you start say breaking up a cube of a material into small pieces, and you go on doing that multiple times, you, will, uh, you are going to increase the specific surface area, which is units of surface area divided by one unit of mass tremendously. And there, that, what it means is that there are a lot of uh, number of molecules sitting on a surface for, a uh, for any given substrate or sub uh, material are much, much larger as compared to uh, the in inside the bulk. So this leads to very interesting properties as Rabi Prata showed some of, uh, in some of his slides. That just because of this, uh, the cold nanoparticle change colors drastically from uh, one, uh, one size to other size just because of these phenomena, because there are a large, large number of uh, atoms that are coming in contact with the surface. And then as soon as they come on the surface, their property change. They, they completely exhibit different properties at the surface. So that leads to uh, us to nanoscale materials. So where, uh, as Rivita has already mentioned some of these, uh, at least one dimension of the pattern or material is smaller than a few hundreds of nanometer. So that leads to uh, very different, altogether different properties than the bulk counterpart. So there are different ways of uh, making these nanomaterials. Uh, some of them, Rabi uh, has already talked about the self-assembly where these small molecules assemble in one particular fashion or uh, other on substrate or given uh, area in a given volume due to their chemical properties. Whereas there is also a template patterning where you can do lithographic or some other tool like micro machining, and then you can break a bigger part uh, material into a smaller material and you get a nano scale or micro scale material. So what are the advantages of this uh, self-assembly? As uh, you can see that since you don't have uh, to add any new instrument, these are very less tedious processes. It's cost effective. There is no fancy equipment needed. But as Ravi showed that there, that there are some uh, areas where, uh, where you will not get a very long range order in these patterns. So you, you are used, forced to use some kind of directed patterning or some template to direct them or to organize them in a special way. Whereas in lithographic processes, they are very reliable. You get long range order, they are tedious. But again, the limitation is that uh, you cannot have a very large area pattern simultaneously on, on these kits. So these are some of the nanoscale nanofabrication methods uh, that we use regularly, that electron beam lithography or focus style beam, dip pen lithography, et cetera. 
most of i think you uh, have used some of these at some point of time in your research uh, these are parallel processes and these are serial processes where you can simultaneously expose large amount of area of substrate or sample uh, to uv light or some other radiation and you can uh, get a uh, large area pattern whereas serial processes are slower but these uh, parallel processes tend to have large more defects as compared to serial processes but it's a very slow and a very expensive process and it takes a lot of time so let's come to now func uh, surface functionalization so there are two aspects of surface functionalization one is chemical functionalization so let's say you have a silane layer uh, on a glass and you expose it to uv ozone treatment uh, you you can make it uh, make the hydrophobic surface to hydrophilic one now here i'm showing here uh, one example that we did in loud lab is that we exposed uh, we first coated a silane layer uh, on top of a glass so that makes it hydrophobic because of this alkane chain long alkane chain sitting on at the top and when you expose this uh, uh, surface to a uv ozone radiation however there was a trick when we expose it we change the velocity we move the substrate through a uv ozone chamber and we moved it in a gradient way so it, initially it was very slow then it was very fast so we change the velocity of the uh, radiation meaning that we change the exposure time so uh, depending on the exposure the amount of exposure time the glass becomes uh, remains more hydrophobic or less hydrophobic depending on the uh, exposure so if, if the glass moved very quickly so for example if here the glass was moving very fast so the uh, most of the alkyl chain remains intact so the glass remains hydrophobic and you can see the droplet is moving uh, has moved considerably downwards whereas in this case the glass was exposed maximum so the droplet is not moving very fast so it is sticking it has become completely hydrophilic and the glass uh, the drop remains completely stuck to the glass in this case uh, so this is uh, one example of chemical functionalization similarly you can also do physical patterning say topographical patterning using some lithographic or self uh, soft lithography or hard lithography whatever you want Uh, micro machining so let's uh, some examples we have seen already uh, from the first presenter where she used a pdms stamp to make pattern substrates so similarly you can use a pat pattern stamp and make a pattern substrate out of pdms or any soft matter uh, soft material like soft polymer and you can get a very nicely patterned uh, polymer or substrate uh, other kind of substrate similar examples already exist in nature where you see a uh, lotus leaf it has very uh, different topographic features on the top side versus bottom side so on the top side you see a very big tall pillars whereas on the bottom side it has very uh, not so tall very small pillars and that that leaves so very different weighting properties at the top and the bottom side of the leaf so of course nature is doing this game is it nature is in this game for long time now uh, we are still very new to this all functionalization and uh, uh, tricks that nature already has its uh, its slave uh, so here are some examples where people have tried to mimic the nature which are very interesting to see that's why i just included here this slide see for example here this is a concrete uh, which mimics the uh, rock formation or rocky reefs inside the uh, sea so what it helps it helps the uh, if you mimic the uh, reef structure on a concrete what they have observed is that it allows the growth of marine life easily on these concrete structures so for example if you want to build something in the sea you should not disturb the biodiversity of uh, the life in the sea, marine life in the sea so it will allow those that marine life to grow easily on such kind of concrete structures so this is of course on my macro scale so this example next example is on a micro scale where this is a particular uh, uh rodent which lives in uh, very uh, dry desert it's a lizard uh, 
so it's called Texas hot lizard. It doesn't get, it doesn't have access to water. So what it does is, it has hydrophilic hairs on top of its skin. And the microstructure is designed in such a way that any sweat or any dew that accumulates on the top of uh, its skin, it slowly migrates towards its uh, mouth. So it gets access to the water, not from any other source, but or from its own sweat and uh, dew in the air. So this is very useful for humid conditions. We have in India uh, such humid conditions almost throughout the year. And we have a uh, scarcity of water in most of the places because it's very dry or uh, there is no water resource nearby. So if we can mimic such kind of structure to collect water from our air, this will be very useful for our environment. This is another example uh, where uh, uh, the aim was to collect plastic pollution from marine uh, life, uh, so from the sea bed. There is a lot of plastic currently going on sea, but how to collect it? So they have mimicked, uh, this is a uh, manta ray and it has a special mechanism to capture its prey. So it has a rib-like structure in its mouth where it just caught, uh, catches the fish and the water flows away from its uh, uh, gulls. So similarly, if you have a structure mimicking this kind of uh, manta ray uh, uh, structures, then you move this uh, structure through the sea, uh, through the sea, and then you you will automatically capture a lot of sea waste, uh, plastic waste in these kind of uh, bags. This is another example where uh, a macro scale uh, phenomena was used to reduce these kind of bullet trends, uh, the, the resistance of these bullet trends. Uh, Ravi probably has gone there and uh, has traveled through this bullet train as well, where this bullet train has a special beak-like structure at the top, uh, at the engine side. And this reduces uh, the air pressure considerably when this train is traveling through a tunnel. And that reduces, uh, because initially they had a big problem where whenever this train traveled, because of this uh, pressure created at the uh, forefront of this train, there was a big sound coming out of the system and that troubled the neighborhood completely. And they, they were scared by that sound. But once they designed this, uh, changed this design of the, uh, design of the engine to this beak like structure, the pressure drop, uh, Come, uh, pressure dropped considerably and uh, there was no sound at all when, when the train traveled through the tunnel. So this is a very unique example uh, where we have directly copied a nature uh, a case to a practical use. So we have of course uh, done some uh, work at uh, uh, this biomimicking at CNS. So some of the examples that I'm just going to show here. I will not discuss uh, except for this. I will not discuss other examples right now, but we have done some work uh, uh, regarding this biomimics that I can do. So first work that I'm going to talk about is uh, regarding SARS sensors. So SARS is, some of you may not, uh, may be new to this field, so I'm just going to explain a little bit. It's a called surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, the short form is SARS. So as you know, Raman spectroscopy is an excellent finger marker, uh, fingerprint marker for many of the organic molecules. So it is very useful tool to detect organic moieties in your sample or uh, the sample of interest. However, the other problem with this is uh, the si signal amplitude is significantly low for Raman signal. So, the, the, so if you, have, but, but it was observed that if you have some of the metallic nanoparticles like gold or silver in vicinity of your organic molecule, uh, there is a considerable enhancement of the signal uh, in this uh, Raman spectroscopy. So this was very uh, useful finding. So now uh, people have started to work on uh, adding nanoparticles and other uh, materials like graphene. They have you know, particularly observed that graphene is very useful for uh, increasing the ACRS intensity 
and we have done some work on this uh, uh, ACRS, uh, developing new ACRS type sensor and I will explain a little bit about them. So there are two different amplification mechanisms uh, that contribute for Raman inten intensity enhancement. Uh, first is electromagnetic enhancement where uh, the surface charge, uh, so Rabi was talking about uh, SPR signal. Uh, so that SPR, uh, surface plasma resonance contributes greatly in enhancing the intensity of this Raman uh, 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 signal. And other is chemical enhancement. As I said, uh, if you add graphene uh, or uh, graphene-like structures in near vicinity to the uh, these nanoparticles and uh, the analyte to be observed, then it was observed that the charge transfer becomes very easy uh, depending on the material. So in some cases, there is a chemical enhancement and uh, most of the cases it is both electromagnetic as well as chemical enhancement that contributes to the increase in uh, Raman intensity. And this is collectively called as SERS or surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. So a properly functionalized SERS substrate can detect a trace level, uh, which is pico or femtomolar concentration of molecules. So this is very useful tool. So we try to develop uh, such uh, system where uh, our ultimate aim is to develop a point of care device uh, to detect various diseases. So currently we have seen that in, uh, since our, uh, this COVID has started, uh, it took uh, almost five months to increase our daily testing capacity to 50,000 samples. That was largely because we are still heavily dependent on other countries for testing kits and components. We don't have indigenous testing kits and uh, which are portable and handy uh, right now at, at our disposal. So we need to have, uh, we need to develop an alternative eco uh, healthcare ecosystem uh, where we can do, uh, we can detect such diseases very quickly and it should be also cost effective and uh, portable, especially considering that more majority of our population lives in a rural area which doesn't have access to most of the health facilities that city or urban population has. So one, so we propose that probably this CRS based uh, selective sensor uh, could be one such tool uh, that can detect at least few of these diseases. And we are trying to develop a couple of them uh, right now at uh, IIT Kanpur. We have already seen that uh, the, the limit of detection is about 10 to minus 15 uh, with our device. So which is uh, almost like a femtomolar uh, case for some of these analytes, uh, which are some of these are explosive uh, analytes because we had some projects with DRDO where they wanted to have this detection of explosives at a very low or trace level molecule. Uh, we also have some tested done or uh, some ongoing work is also uh, there on these. Uh, biomarkers such as uric acid, where we can detect the uric acid uh, at the nanomolar level. So depending on uh, the binding uh, chemistry that we use, we can uh, detect various different analytes using the same sensor. So this is one example uh, where this uh, SARS sensor was especially uh, used for detection of explosive. So this is a uh, dinitrotoluene uh, is a specific marker for uh, uh, explosive. We tried to uh, develop a sensor. Uh, this was a, uh, so initially we took a silver shape and it was mic a micro machine or pattern using a laser. And this laser, uh, ablates the silver and what we observed that this is the original uh, sheet which was not non-ablated and when we uh, pattern it using a laser the depending on the, uh, the power of the laser which was varied from uh, different uh, power scales and the time that we expose the silver uh, sheet to it we can get various different depths and widths of these uh, nanostructures uh, microstructures actually. 
So the other interesting phenomena that happens simultaneously was that as we are ablating the silver from this, it has to go somewhere. And what is what is doing is that in, uh, once the laser ablates the silver, uh, knocks out the silver atoms, they deposit in the vicinity of this pattern. So we try to exploit that, and we try to vary the uh, width and depth of these patterns, and we check where the silver is depositing, and whether these nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles depositing in the vicinity, can enhance the SIRS signal considerably. And indeed, what we found that depending on the laser energy and uh, uh, the depth and ablated width was changed. And depending on where uh, the molecules are sitting, if they are sitting near the vicinity of these uh, nanoparticles, ablated nanoparticles uh, sitting at the top surface, the, the Raman enhancement was significant as compared to region two where uh, it's in the middle of the two ablated region where there are minimum number of part, uh, silver particles sitting uh, the, the enhancement was very less as compared to uh, adjacent to the ablation region. So this, uh, the, and we found that the enhancement, uh, we calculated the enhancement factor as well, which was close to 10 to 15 or something, so which is very good for uh, their press detection. Similarly, we have done uh, more work on the SIRS using micro patterning, on using chemical synthesis, as well as electrospinning. So currently, we what we are trying to do is uh, we are trying to electrospun uh, graphitizing and non-graphitizing carbon. And what we see is that the graphitizing carbon leads to much much higher intensity uh, enhancement as compared to non-graphitizing carbon. And we are about to publish that work very soon. This is the second example. Uh, this is a very old example from my postdoc days, uh, but it's very interesting because here uh, we change the both physical and chemical properties of the substrate and observe its effect on the orientation of uh, block copolymers. So these block copolymers are nothing but uh, two uh, immiscible polymers joined together by a covalent bond. So this is called diblock copolymer. If there are three, then it's called tri-block copolymer and more and so on. So if, if these two uh, di-block copolymers, they are thermally heated or exposed to solvent vapor, uh, what happens is that they tend to phase segregate. Now this phase segregation typically occurs on a very small scale, which is in nanometer scale. Now, if we can exploit that nanometer scale for some of the applications like uh, for example, here I have shown one example from Hitachi Global Storage Technologies where they have developed a magnetic media patterning uh, device. This is it's a storage device where uh, they use a block copolymer film and phase separated it and etched out one of the uh, blocks from the selective uh, selectively from this uh, film and exposed the magnetic and filled it with the magnetic material. And that magnetic material, uh, it acts as a storage media now. And this has a capacity of one terabyte uh, in per, per square inch. So it's a very high storage capacity considering it's only one square inch in size. So this, this is one example where block polymer can be direct, uh, has been directly used for developing such a device. But for that, what we uh, what needs to be done is that we need to have access to the both of the phases. As Ravi Bhutta was showing in one example where the, uh, the blend was sitting on top of each other and there was a lamellar kind of structure. If they are sitting on top of each other, we are exposed, uh, we are uh, seeing only top, uh, top level polymer uh, at the surface, on the top surface. But if we have a vertical orientation, Way, like shown here, where there is one PS phase and the other is PMM phase, and we selectively etch out this PMM phase, we can get a very nicely, uh, a nice, uh, we can get nice patterns in uh, substrate or polymer film, and we can have a very large area. That is the big, biggest advantage of block copolymer, that you get a very large area simultaneously pattern on nanoscale. 
which is very difficult to do using any of the existing techniques right now in, in the world. Even by E-beam or deep U ultra UV lithography, it's very difficult to obtain such kind of structures on a very large area scale. So this is the biggest advantage block polymer has. And if we can control the orientation of this block polymer, that is the biggest uh, challenge to control it and to have this kind of orientation on top of each other. So for example, I've shown here, this, this is what typically a block of polymer will look like. And they, these are lamellae. So red and blue are two different phases of the polymer and they sit on top of each other. Typically, this is called a, a horizontal orientation. But if we can flip them like this, then this is called a vertical orientation. And we can selectively then etch out one of these phases and make use of this patterning uh, tool uh, for a develop, uh, the patterning template for developing new devices. So this is uh, one of the work that Karim initiated a uh, long time back, where he was just seeing effect of surface energy on the orientation of block of Where you can see that at the V means vertical orientation, H means horizontal orientation. The V is the region where the block of polymer is oriented vertically and H is the region where the block of polymer is oriented horizontally. So this is one example of how the surface energy uh, can be used for changing the orientation of block of polymer in uh, these films. However, the limitation is that the films has to be very, very small, thinner films. So this is what typically a uh, block of polymer phase diagram looks like. Uh, if you have 50-50% uh, equal amount of polymers, two, two different polymers, uh, then you have a lamellar kind of uh, phase phases in the block of polymer. So this is what we are using right now. So the motivation for our work was to try to find out uh, actually if apart from the surface energy, can roughness of the substrate also help in orientating these block of polymer films vertically. So that was our motivation. So this was the original paper that we were following. Uh, this was by Savani et al, where they had shown that if the surface roughness of the, the substrate is above a particular value, this is called critical value, then they, uh, they have shown that the lamellae orient vertically uh, no matter what. However, then there were some subsequent publications that contradicted their own results. So we were trying to find, uh, find out what exactly uh, actually contributes to the orientation of these block of polymers, whether it has to be a neutral surface, whether it has to be hierarchically rough, or if this condition is sufficient. So then we uh, went on developing a new method for changing the roughness of the substrate uh, so this this was my original uh, PhD work where I was using tetraethyl orthosilicate for making aerogels. So I was I, I thought that maybe I will use this uh, uh, knowledge and then make rough substrates out of this. So now you can see that just by changing the concentration of catalyst and uh, aging time, we can we can have a great control over the roughness of these films. Also, I'm adding a trimethylsilane layer, so which will give it a hydrophobicity. So it will be also a neutral layer. Uh, so both these polymers won't like that layer, so they will remain neutral to this substrate. So, so we can simultaneously now vary the roughness. So as you can see, the roughness is about 0.5. And here it's about 2, and then uh, this is about 30, 39. So you can now increasingly vary the roughness as well as the surface energy by just exposing it to uh, UV, you can change the surface energy as well. So we did that using a flow coating. So using a flow coating, I will just try to run this. So this is what a typical flow coating is in this slide. So this is a glass blade, which is shown here. And then it has, uh, so this pipe where the liquid is flowing. And then I'm coating this liquid on top of the substrate. 
and you can see that the, the film is forming. Now I can change the speed of this. So the I can change the speed of this blade, and depending on the blade velocity, you will get thinner or thicker. So count, count, uh, contrasting with the uh, is it the common spinning that we use, where we have at higher RPM thinner films. Here actually you get thicker films at higher velocity. That is because liquids are incompressible. So the blade skips a lot of liquid uh, behind, and that's why you get thicker films at a higher velocity. And also, if you are so there's a then you have a gradient thin film thickness along this way, and then if you expose orthogonally uh, this substrate to a uh, UV or uh, UV ozone uh, kind of tube, then you can also change the surface energy along this direction and thickness along this direction. So in one sample, I can generate more than thousands of data points. And that is very useful for such experiments where even a small change in thickness or small change in surface energy can greatly affect your outcome. So this is a very useful tool to have. So that can generate a library of samples on a single substrate. So you are keeping all these conditions identical. So this is what it looks like. So the thickness will be varying in this direction. So I varied the thickness from 25 to 150 nanometer in one direction. And the surface substrate energy was varied from 29 millijoules to 70 millijoules. So the substrate was initially exposed to UV and then the films were coated on top. So, and then we had this hydrophobic propyl ligands on top of it. And that once they are exposed to this uh, UV uh, ozone, then you can change the surface mode. So then we observed using AFM as well as uh, neutron scattering, the uh, structures that we were, uh, the orientation of these block of polymers and try to see where, what we get. So as you can see here, uh, these are vertically oriented uh, phases. So most of the area here, you see vertical orientation. Whereas as you go along the thickness, the, the orientation, vertical oriented region becomes smaller and smaller. And here you get completely horizontal orientation. And again, as you go along the thicker side, and again, you see some flipping of uh, the orientation. So you get some vertical orientation and some uh, regions with horizontal orientation and so on. And then we actually, uh, because AFM is a very uh, surface phenomenon, so that can, uh, that has access only to the surface of the film. We actually use neutron scattering to uh, detect the inside of the film and uh, found that indeed the, uh, the, the vertical orientation uh, is there uh, wherever we see this vertical orientation on the top of the surface. If we also use the X-ray uh, scattering, uh, this is called grazing incidence, small angle X-ray scattering. Uh, where you can also get such kind of uh, X-ray scattering patterns from the uh, depending on the orientation of the films to detect the internal structure of the film. So from both these methods, we confirm that the uh, the orientation is what it is seen in uh, AFM. So it's not only a surface phenomena but also a bulk phenomena. And then what we interestingly observed that the roughness is not uh, not a very uh, important factor. In fact, most important factor is the factor dimension of the substrate. So as you can see, this 30 nanometer is the most uh, rough film that we had. However, only a fraction of uh, that uh, film had uh, actually shows vertical orientation. Whereas even for a uh, five nanometer rough film with a very high factor dimension of 2.5 or 2.6, you get almost 100% vertical orientation in such kind of on such kind of substrate. So we conclude that the periodic surface is not the only necessity. Roughness helps in vertical orientation, but it's not all only sufficient. The factor dimension is a more critical uh, factor, and so the factor higher the factor dimension, you get better vertical orientation. And why it is because because the polymer if it has to orient horizontally on such a substrate, it is easy for it for a low factor dimension where there are less contours on the surface 
to orient it and allow to lie along the substrate. Whereas for high uh, fractal dimension film, it's almost impossible for film, uh, such film to stay there, but horizontally oriented. Instead, it is energetically favorable for it to, to be vertically oriented like this. And we had some theoretical support as well. Uh, uh, Amit Ranjan was one of another postdoc working with Professor Sharma at this time. And he actually showed that it is indeed true that the higher the fractal dimension, the better the vertical orientation. So other example is this uh, lotus-like uh, Janus films that we developed. Uh, this was uh, work when Chandra was here, I think. So this is, this is the lotus leaf. Uh, you can see that the top surface has a, a very different microstructure as compared to uh, the lower substrate. Now the top surface for a lotus leaf that grows mostly in the muddy water, it has to have a very clean uh, surface, otherwise it will die. If the leaves are not clean, uh, it will just die. So it has to remove all the dust from the top. So it has to have a self-cleaning property as uh, initially the first presenter was explaining. So the self-cleaning property is very important. So such kind of self-cleaning properties come from uh, this functionality uh, given by roughness as well as some wax layer that sits on top of these nodules and that gives it a uh, super hydrophobic and self-cleaning property. However, the lower side that mostly remains in water, uh, in contact with water, it has completely different microstructure and you can see that it has a very different wetting property uh, on the top as well as the bottom side. So we developed some uh, similar structures here. Uh, so we call them Janus films. Uh, this is a Greek god named Janus. It has, uh, it has probably two different faces. So uh, uh, depicting two different personalities of the same person. So similarly, we developed a film where you can see that this is a very hydrophilic re uh, uh, region so because the capillary is going up. And whereas this side is completely hydrophobic because the water is pushing down. So you get a positive meniscus here. So these are similar to Janus particles where they have two different uh, uh, same particle which, have, which has two different properties on its uh, surfaces. So on one side you have contact angle of about 160 and the other side is very less. So how we made this film? So we, these films were made at the oil water interface. So we actually group the films in situ. So again, I use my PhD uh, thesis knowledge uh, to grow these uh, silica films at the interface of oil and water. Because these films are growing at oil and water, naturally what happens is that the uh, hydrophobic tails that we had uh, in, uh, incorporated the PRTMS that we have, we were adding, they tend to uh, grow towards uh, the heptane, the oil phase, because they don't like water. So they tend to go away and uh, grow here. So that leaves a very unique wetting property uh, of the, for these films. So you can see that the drops are bouncing and the drops are rolling also from this top side surface. Whereas as soon as the drop reaches the other side, it actually gets uh, sucked in because the other side is hydrophilic. So you can clearly see that it has two different uh, surface properties on top and bottom. So uh, the Raman spectra actually confirmed that, that we had a very big uh, change in the CH intensity on the oil side surface versus oil water side surface. And that actually leads to higher hydrophobicity on the water side surface, uh, the oil side surface. And also the microstructure was very different because the films are grow, uh, the oil side surface has less access to the water and the water had the uh, catalyst to condense the silica. These structures were more porous as compared to water side. So the water side, you can see that the structures are very dense 
but whereas the oil side the structures are much much porous uh, porous so that gives it another another advantage uh, that the cassie baxter type wetting property whenever you put a drop on it there will be air pockets below the drop and that gives it uh, the unique genus uh, genus properties so this very very much looks like uh, the lotus leaf Uh, where you have more porosity on top top side of the leaf, whereas less porosity at the bottom side of the leaf, and this actually looks very similar. So then, naturally, the next instinct, instinctive experiment is to try and add some surfactant to the substrate. As soon as you add surfactant, uh, surfactant, what these surfactants will do is that they tend to assemb uh, assemble at the oil water interface. depending on the concentration uh, so and the the, uh, the hydrophobic tail will orient itself towards the uh, oil side and the hydrophobic uh, hydrophilic tail or uh, the head will orient itself towards the water side and now the film will start to grow uh, at this interface at such interface where the surface energy has now uh, decreased considerably and we observe that indeed the structures are very different now you see the oil side surface is still porous but it's not that as porous as it was initially so because of the change in surface energy uh, the interfacial energy of the oil and water and the water side surface and oil side surface has slightly different microstructure however the wetting properties were not that different so if you see the uh, advancing and receding contact angle Uh, for the uh, without surfactant we had always the uh, change uh, uh, difference in the advancing and contact uh, receding contact angle almost stable at 60 degrees whereas with surfactant as the surface inclination angle was increased you can see that the change almost disappeared and it becomes almost uh, similar to what uh, it was for high both uh, hydro uh, the water side as well as oil side this is another study that we are currently working on uh, we are about to publish a patent now uh, we are file a patent on, on this now so this is a uh, quite new work that we are working on uh, it's called agar uh, it's called bacterial culture dry fiber nanofiber mats so right now all all the uh, pathological tests that are done uh, in india or uh, almost anywhere in the world are based on agar plating so agar plating is the most common method in practice uh, but it needs expert handling of samples and uh, plating experience as well the other problem with agar plating is that the the patient has to come to lab and give it give the sample for let's say a urine or blood sample or saliva sample and then they they Uh, plate those uh, samples and then they it, it grows on the plate and then they say confirm whether you have a bacterial infection or not so this is what is commonly done right now so that has uh, put a severe uh, limitation on its portability and uh, access to remote locations so as you can imagine this plating is not very accessible for a lot of rural areas in india so we have to do something about that so we thought that maybe we can do a dry uh, uh, substrate we can develop a dry substrate where we can grow bacteria easily and that should be also portable and storable so we can uh, since because uh, these uh, nanofiber based culture culture mats are dry you can actually cut them uh, into small pieces and pack them sterically and store them for long time and uh, it can be cultured because the sample the patient has to just put a drop of saliva or blood on top of it and then pack it again and send it back so it it is it can be cultured by a non expert with very less training so this this has a tremendous benefits if it is successful so we try to develop these kind of mats and i'm going to show you some results Uh, because this is still in filing process so i am not going to reveal too much about the tape the, the polymers that we used and the materials that we used but this is some of this is the process so we had some biocompatible polymers and uh, some bacterial culture media 
and then we spin code it, co spin it, electro spun it, and make uh, this uh, fiber mat. The, once the fiber mats are made, we also have uh, a control sample with us, and then we cut it into small pieces, and then we put a sample uh, drop of uh, analyte from on top of these mats. And once we put the drop of analyte on this mat, these mats are exposed to a little bit of humidity. It's not a very uh, difficult experiment to do. You just have to put some water drops in a petri dish and put a water uh, this uh, put this uh, mat in the petri dish and close it. So just just the, that humidity is enough for the bacteria. Uh, for the media from the fibers to come out and allow the bacterial growth on the map. The beauty of this method is, let's say you have a patient somewhere sitting, uh, somewhere staying in, let's say three days from here. So it takes about three days for his sample to arrive. So what we can do is we can ship the sample with these mats to him. He can uh, put his drop, a drop of blood or saliva on top of these mats. And then we can give supply with the mat. We, are, we can also supply a petri dish kind of thing uh, for him to store it and ship it back. So he can ship it back. And by the time it comes to the lab, we, the bacterial culture is already done. So you just have to confirm it uh, using an expertise, uh, uh, expert in pathological lab, whether the, the sample has bacteria, bacterial growth or not. So that is the most important aspect of this whole uh, study. So you can see that we have done uh, different uh, media. Uh, we have grown this, uh, we have added this media and the fiber look uh, very much intact. There is not much change in the change in uh, morphology of the fibers. And we confirm that the media is present using X-ray and uh, EDS uh, detection, that indeed the media is everywhere. It's not only at selective places. So if the fiber can, uh, the bacteria can grow easily. The other advantage with this uh, fiber mat is that agar plate is a very two-dimensional surface, whereas uh, this fiber mat is a three-dimensional surface. So it allows a more natural uh, way for bacteria or even cells to grow on such kind of surface. So here are some of the examples that we have seen that E. coli bacteria, uh, you can easily grow on these dry sheets. So we just expose that uh, uh, we put a small inoculation uh, drop of these E. coli uh, bacteria on top of these uh, fibers, max, and then expose it to humidity and allow the bacteria to grow. Of course, E. coli bacteria is very easy to grow on almost any surface, but we tested it with some other bacteria as well, and it works very fine. So this is another example just showing some microscopic images that uh, using DAPI that actually the bacteria is growing and uh, as a function of time. Now, this is a three-dimensional, as I was saying, that uh, since the, the fibers are porous, it actually provides a 3D kind of uh, you know, substrate for bacteria to grow. So it, it, indeed, we observe that as a function of depth, the more bacteria are growing inside the bag, inside the film. So this is another example where this is a more practical example for uh, bacteria so where TB is one of the most threat, life threatening uh, condition in India. And almost two lakh people die out of, uh, because of TB every year. However, it takes more than 15 days to diagnose presence of mycobacterium on, in the agar pleating media. So it's a very time consuming process and time is, a, is the key for any treatment, treatment of any disease. The early detection is key. So in such cases, if the patient is uh, away from uh, these pathological labs, it's very difficult for him to give sample. So it takes a lot of time even to culture these uh, bacteria and confirm that, okay, indeed the person has TB or not. So such, and in such cases, this uh, culture bacteria, uh, the medium uh, can be easily shipped to him. And by the time the, the sample arrives, we will know the result already, whether the person has TB or not. So that is the beauty of this uh, method. We of course have some uh, more example, but because of lack of time, I will not go into details. Uh, 
Chandra will remember some of these because I have done some work with him as well on this, uh, on carbon MEMS, where we could grow cells on these uh, pattern substrates and uh, carbonized pattern substrates. This is one recent example where uh, carbon substrates were initially, uh, these are photoreys based carbon substrates. So photoreys was actually films were wrinkled and that wrinkling gives to very interesting alignment on the cell, of the cells on the surfaces. So these are our thrust areas at uh, nanoscience. Uh, so, so this is what summary is. Uh, is uh, we just looked at some of the surface functionalization methods and uh, these are obviously very important tool for designing new and new materials and devices and various physical chemical functionalization strategies also we explored. Uh, I would be happy to have any questions you have. Uh, this is acknowledgement. Some of the students that worked on these projects were Madhuparna, Gaurav and Tanya. These are my former bosses and some of the collaborators. These are the facilities that uh, where I had this access of uh, neutron scattering and uh, X-ray scattering. And thank you very much for your time. And thank you for listening to me so patiently. Of course, you don't have any options. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Manisham Kulkarni, for your informative talk. I am also thankful to Professor Rivartha Mukherjee for inspiring us in this area. I am sure your presentations must have helped viewers to have a better insight and think in the aligned directions. We hope all the viewers have posted their questions. Now, we will take the viewers' questions one by one. We will try our best to pick up the maximum questions in the available time frame. Take uh, Sony, so I think Professor Ravi has to leave for a so meeting. I can also see the questions uh, posted in uh, the yes. YouTube. So, Srinath, thank you for your insightful comment. Uh, Runalini, maybe some other day I will share more memories, but Chandra has more memories to share because he had a better and bigger overlap with the Kanpur group. In fact, during its, his time, the group started to really expand, and he was instrumental during the inauguration and setting up of the Nano Science Center. So, he and Manish were the key driving forces and helps her a lot in setting it up. Uh, so there's the RIE question, I think from uh, Rupsana is for Manish. So I will take up the question from Akanksha. Yeah, so question is, can you, uh, so when I say that we can create multi-layer films, can we control the film thickness? The answer to it is yes, it is possible to control the film thickness in a spin coding platform by very easily taking the uh, concentration of the solution. It is it's a very standard technique, but one can argue that whether the same particle concentration will work as effectively for different thicknesses or not, that's a question that needs to be looked into. Uh, so Muranini has a question for Manish. There so is a question for you from Shriyanshu. I can't see any, any of these comments. So we, will possible, take, we will take. Because it hold nanoparticles on top of hydrophobic solution. I think this is also for Manish. I don't, uh, so yeah. So on hydrophobic film, yeah. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question, Shreyansh, with the way that uh, when we are coating uh, something from an organic solvent, if you are very careful about the pedagogy and the science part of it, uh, whether the surface is hydrophobic or hydrophilic really doesn't matter. Whether the surface is weighted by that particular solvent or not is more important. So whether I use a makeshift terminology as a solvophobic and solvophilic, now it turns out that many surfaces which are hydrophobic may actually still end up wetting an organic solvent, right? So yeah, that there is an advantage you have. The other option is that if you really have something non-wetting, you can still do some technique like drop casting, rely on evaporation of the solvent, and you can still have the gold or whatever you want to deposit on the surface. So in principle, it is possible by little bit of twisting and understanding of the physics of the system, to have films on a non-wettable surface. That's probably the answer I would like to give. It is possible, it's not that something, it's uh, impossible. Also, I had a couple of questions from Chandra himself here in the chat box. Yeah. So when I say that uh, we had nanoparticle induced suppression, uh, Chandra feels it's a temporary measure. It may be, but in fact, what turns out is if you look into Gunter Reiter's 2005 Nature Materials, where they say that slow release of the residual stresses, et cetera, et cetera, is uh, responsible for uh, deviating, triggering deviating, and long-term you may see instability. So Chandra, essentially what you have given me is a very good lead. 
I would not like to comment on this, but now because being an experimentalist, I don't know the future. But probably presence of the nanoparticles is also going to change the nature of the release of these long-term stresses. So that probably needs some bit of investigation. It may so happen depending on whether the particles are compatible with the chains or not. It might enhance the release or suppress the release. And if somehow it suppresses the release because of the conformal entropic effect, et cetera, et cetera, you might actually be looking at uh, a much longer term stability than we all of us anticipate. That's my 101 type answer. Maybe this needs a very detailed investigation and maybe it's worth looking at. The other question is about 55 nanometer. Yeah, we can go higher, more than 55 nanometer, not a big deal. The issue is that uh, the strength of the Van der Waals interactions, you know this very, very well, uh, progressively reduces with the uh, increase in the film thickness. So on a defect-free surface, probably you will see enhanced stability due to weakening of the disjoining pressure straight away. You don't really need the particle blah, blah to do it. But having said that, the particles might still be used for some functionalization purpose. And therefore it might still be useful to look into the particle and their dispersion into the system and stuff like that. So again, some open questions. I would not directly interpolate or extrapolate by saying whatever you see up to 60 nanometer is going to happen for a 500 nanometer thick film chakra. Maybe yeah, uh, as Manish talked about uh, flow coating and other type of techniques, the deposition and the in situ nature of the particle agglomeration or distribution within the system itself might change depending on the technique. Because spin coating, as you know, is a very highly non-equilibrium process because of rapid quenching. Other techniques, the quenching might be much, much gentle. So that's all probably I had to comment. Uh, even I think the nature of these nanoparticles okay. will have an effect, right? I mean, the kind of interaction you're talking about. So hydrophobic, oh, absolutely. hydrophobic absolutely. interaction. Absolutely, absolutely. Not only the nature, same, same nanoparticle, yeah, Manish. Uh, same nanoparticle, even the solvent is going to play a role. Yeah. Yeah, Manish. Yeah, yeah. So I had another question related to the aggregation of these nanoparticles. When we are talking about these blend films, and you showed that they are sitting lamellar, they are uh, actually not phase separating, but they are sitting in lamellar kind of orientation. These these nanoparticles, do you see aggregating at the interface of these blends? No, they. We thought that they are going to the interface, but they are actually migrating to the top surface. They're actually yeah. migrating to the top surface, but yeah, but what is happening as, as it is going to the top surface, it is making the top film stable. So the interfacial instability that leads to this lateral phase segregation is somehow getting suppressed. We still need some uh, bit of more experiments to get a full idea about it. And it would be very good if we can see, see what we are actually investigating is the remnant. Because yeah. when you do even an XRR, you are looking at a system when only the two polymers are there, the solvent has disappeared. But the phase separation is actually taking place in a much more complicated system. It's actually a quad, um, I mean, quadruple system where you have the two polymers, the solvent, and the particles. I don't think any technique as of now offers that much amount of insight to pick up. So maybe you have to solvate them and do some neutron and try to find out how they're how they're migrating and a very high energy source where you can pick up very fast data and see the migration. Sure. sure. So Manish and Chandra, you have to excuse me. I have to rush for another yeah, thanks, minute. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, sure, it's time. great to see all of you. And thank you so much. And sorry to the audience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So now uh, let's resume the question answer session uh, with Manish. There, are, I can see there are a lot of questions. So Roxana and Sony, I think we can take questions from Dr. Manish. Yes, sir. Yeah, first question is for uh, to Dr. Manishim Kulkarni. The first oh. question is, can RIE be useful despite of its low H rate? Can we use DRI methods? Yeah, yeah. RIE is a very versatile tool. So you can actually change the etching rate very easily. That's just by changing the power of these RIE. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. My next question is how to ensure or measure the adherence of pin film to the surface where it is coated? That entirely depends on the substrate surface energy. Most of the cases, if the substrate surface energy is high, the film will stick. But at lower surface energy, if, for example, if you want to coat something on PDMS, it's very difficult. So you have to change the surface uh, surface energy and play with it. Then only you will get better addition. Okay, sir. Then the third question is whether wetting and de-wetting are thermodynamically or kinetic kinetically favored. No, that again depends on the conditions that you are uh, putting the sample in. 
for example if you just uh, putting the sample at room temperature as rabikata showed that if it is at room temperature nothing happens the film sits as it is however in some cases if the uh, film thickness is beyond uh, below a critical limit uh, where the spinodal divetting can uh, dominate then even, even at room temperature it, it divets so it entirely depends on the conditions that you have okay sir so the next question is is it possible to deposit gold nano particles on top of a hydrophobic film during film formation itself to avoid use of lingers like apts mm, sony i think this question was for professor ravi bhata okay so uh, so here we have a question for uh, manish uh, from vikram so how the study is going to differ if we replace the gram negative e coli with the gram positive bacteria now we have tried with all uh, all different kinds of bacteria and they grow very easily on most of them yeah, i think it was quite interesting to see the use of these nanofibers met uh, as a replacement for agar because uh, as you rightly said it's not just only the uh, replacement but i think you are creating a more suitable environment in terms of 3d exactly. so i think it's a very wonderful uh, work uh, from your group uh, so we have uh, one more question uh, to you manish so could you please elaborate a little on how the wrinkling of carbon surfaces leads to the alignment of the cells uh, so uh, right now i cannot go into all the details but you can go through the paper the paper is available on that uh, i think this is about the buckling right yeah, yeah, no no so even recently when we were doing this photolithographic uh, suet films mm -hmm. and uh, when they were exposing uh, to the different amount of uv uh, for uh, hardening the film we see that there is a wrinkling i think but and that wrinkling itself because of the it if the wrinkling uh, pattern matches with the cell dimensions the the cell grows more favorably on such conditions that is why it, it aligns better better in certain cases i hope you have an addressed all the queries of our viewers and hope i i hope they are at satisfied with your answers now we would request dr manish to please give a few suggestions for the young researchers working in this area no i i just have one suggestion that do not lose your patience that is the key if you lose your patience you will lose your interest and then uh, you will uh, stray from your goal so just keep your patience it takes time it's a research research is a very time taking and painstaking phenomena it's not it doesn't happen in one day uh, your lab itself you can see that how much time it has taken to grow in last 10 years uh, and what what achievements you have done because of just patience that you have shown so your lab is best example <laughs> it is follow your lab thanks manish yes thank you sir in the end on the behalf of carbon lab we, we wish to thank all our distinguished speaker Dr. Ravi Bhuta Mukherjee and Dr. Manish M. Kulkarni for sparing the precious time to share their research ideas. We believe that Carbon Lab members, alumni, and other viewers on YouTube found it very useful and may get some new insight in this area. For the information to our viewers, this was the last webinar in the series of 10th anniversary of Carbon Lab. You can follow all our four webinars on the YouTube channel. Starting from mid-December from this webinar series. We have organized many events, including international sci-art image competition and internship competition. We are looking forward to the final event next month in the form of a symposium with our collaborators and present and past members of Carbon Lab. That will also be the concluding ceremony for the ongoing 10th anniversary celebration of Carbon Lab. Further, we are also uploading our latest research public dissertation through the videos in simple language. Please subscribe and follow the Carbon Lab YouTube channel for further updates. Till then, thank you, everyone. Take care, be safe, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. Yeah, I think uh, I got to know about some latest insight about the uh, results. I think they are really uh, encouraging and very interesting. So I hope to have more discussion.